Good morning. Uh, I'm Doug Holtick, and President of the American Action Forum. And thank you for joining us for today's conversation on uh, shining the light on the FCC. Um, we will have uh, opening remarks by our distinguished keynote speaker, followed by a panel uh, moderated by Rob Pegararo of Yahoo Tech and USA Today. But it's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Mike O'Reilly, uh, the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, he has been a commissioner since October of 2013. But for those who are familiar with uh, Congress and Capitol Hill, uh, Mike is familiar for his work in a, a wide variety of areas. He has a long history as a policy analyst and has worked in telecommunications, healthcare, and numerous other things. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to welcome an old friend back to the stage here at AF. Uh, please welcome Michael Riley. Well, thank you so very much for that warm and uh, kind introduction and for the opportunity to be here today. If it's all right with everyone, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes and then take any questions the audience may have. I am so pleased to precede such a distinguished panel hosted by American Action Forum. In such a short time, AAF has distinguished itself as a leading voice in many policy issues, including key communications and technology debates. These activities flow from its overall mission statement, which reads, AAF injects forward-thinking ideas into the public debate that build, a, that build a better economic future, promoting innovation, free market solutions to create a smaller, smarter government. A worthy function indeed, given the oversupply of organizations that push a far, far different agendas centered on government growth and intrusion. Moreover, AAF's guiding views correspond fairly well with my overall approach to issues and items at the Commission. The subject matter of the upcoming panel, Shining the Spotlight on the FCC, How Rules Impact Consumer and Industries, is fitting given all the activity at this FCC over the last two plus years. What I, well, I had always hoped that coming into this job, the policy direction wouldn't be so slanted towards the left. I always expected it to be busy and never dull. Maybe the late David Bowie captured my expectations best in saying, I don't know where I'm going from here, but I promise it won't be boring. As many of you know, the FCC is a regulatory body. Its business is regulation, and business is booming. By reinterpreting old, outdated old law and precedent in creative and destructive ways, there is little doubt that the Commission's leadership has attempted to assert its prominence above that of the private sector. In the current formulation, there seems to be few, if any, practical limits to the Commission's power over its regulatees, a class that seems to be expanding at an alarming rate. We are just starting to witness the implications of the catch-all regulatory approach exemplified by the general internet conduct standard, which will force every internet service provider to secure the agency's tacit or explicit permission for any new offering going forward. Ultimately, the cost will be borne by consumers in terms of higher prices and more limited choice. The Commission seems determined to prove that the assessment of Milton Freeman, that many people want the government to protect the consumer, a much more urgent problem is to protect the consumer from the government. I'll briefly discuss two current examples, the move to expand the Lifeline program without instituting any real cost controls, and the regulatory tunnel vision that allowed Netflix to downgrade its service to certain consumers while crying wolf about the potential for ISPs to do the same thing and demanding an overhaul of the entire communications landscape to stop them. Later this week, the Commission is poised to approve a vast expansion of the Lifeline program, which currently subsidizes voiced phone service for low-income consumers to include subsidies for broadband. This program, along with, pro with programs subsidizing service for high-cost rural areas, schools, and libraries, is funded by universal service fees on consumers' phone bills. But it is only, it's the only universal service program that does not operate under a budget and it appears it will remain so despite my best efforts. I've long argued that Lifeline should have a budget, and I believe that the program can be reformed to include broadband while staying within reasonable fiscal limits. Given the lingering concerns about waste, fraud, and abuse in the program, reiterated by GAO as recently as last summer, this seems 
like the least that should be done to ensure effective stewardship of the universal service dollars being harvested directly from consumers each month. However, the commission majority appears determined to bar ahead with a fig leaf mechanism that doesn't resemble any reasonable definition of the word budget. If, it's, if the stated spending figure, a 50% increase in, in over 2015 spending is approached, there's an expectation that the commission would take some unspecified appropriate action, which could be actually to increase the budget by another 50%. In fact, if the Commission agrees to change the proposal to accommodate concerns expressed by outside parties and some members of Congress, it may very well do so indeed. Or it could choose not to act, and presumably the spending could just continue unimpeded. This is not a budget, but rather the closest thing I have seen yet to, opening treat, to, to openly treating the American consumer as a bottomless piggy bank. On another topic. Given the developments of last week, I want to share with you my thoughts on the revelation that next Netflix has been actively downgrading the video quality of its service delivered over certain wireless networks. Netflix has attempted to paint a picture of altruism, where it has virtuously sought to save these consumers from bumping up against or exceeding their data caps. There's no way to sugarcoat it. The news is deeply disturbing and justly generates calls for government and maybe even congressional investigations. Well, the Federal Trade Commission may have grounds to, to scrutinize Netflix video throttling, let's accept the factual point that Netflix never violated the commission's net neutrality rules enacted last February. The company and net neutrality advocates have been vehement in stressing that the net neutrality rules only apply to ISPs, not standalone edge providers such as Netflix. This is completely correct as all of the prohibitive practices, costs, and obligations of those rules only apply to broadband providers. So there is no net neutrality violation to explore. Moreover, I would strongly oppose any efforts to capture edge providers in the Commission's net neutrality rules or a similar regime. It is not surprising to hear calls for the equal application of these rules to all internet companies. In fact, I predicted this would occur sooner or later. It is only human nature that some ISPs want the burdens imposed on them to apply to all internet companies. But that would be a colossal mistake. The solution to unnecessary regulatory burdens and overreach is not to subject everyone to them, but to reduce them for all. In other words, use the parity argument to help companies and consumers alike rather than dragging everyone into the abyss. While we must absolutely resist any efforts to subject Netflix and other edge providers to net neutrality rules, its admission and activities raise at least two critical areas that demand com com commission attention. First, a company cannot knowingly make, rep uh, ma excuse me, make misrepresentations and inaccurate stations before the commission. In fact, doing so violates the commission rules intended to protect the integrity of the commission and our decisions. Certainly, Netflix made repeated accusations of wrongdoing by ISPs, and all the while knowing that its own practices were the cause of consumer video downgrading. I would suggest that we review all of the comments filed by Netflix to see if there has been any violation of the commission rules. Second, we must all acknowledge that Netflix was not some passive participant when it came to the formation if the consumer's Title II mandates for net neutrality. It was a key representative of the supposed marketplace the rules were designed to protect, the over-the-top video distribution business. Many rules were based on the representations made by Netflix and other similarly situated entities, including Google. Certainly, the entire interconnection regime was predicated on the fears of anti-competitive peering and gatekeeper status concocted by Netflix, and yet, at the same time it was making these claims, Netflix itself was engaging in highly suspect behavior. These revelations call into question the entire foundation and rationale for the net neutrality decision. In closing, I would like to leave with you the thought that the interests of consumers should be viewed more broadly than the policy wish list 
of the moment being pushed by those who market themselves as consumer advocates. We owe it to consumers to treat their dollars with respect and to double and triple check our assumptions about complex marketplaces rather than getting locked into a regulatory tunnel vision that will ultimately leave consumers with fewer choices and more expensive ones indeed. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate your time and listening to my comments. So the commissioner has agreed to uh, answer some questions. If you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. We'll get you a microphone. Uh, stand, identify yourself, and um, ask your question in the form of a question. Don't be shy. Did I stump everyone so early? There we go. Sure. Uh, hi, Commissioner. Jimmy Hoover with Law360. Can you talk a little bit more about um, your efforts to look into some of the comments that Netflix has made with the commission and if what sure. can we can expect to see in the future? Well, uh, two parts. The, the first part, my efforts have just started. Um, it just it was something that, that came to light last week. Um, I actually was out of the office yesterday. I wasn't feeling 100 percent. So um, we're going to we're going to start to do some of that work. Hopefully the commission itself will do so. I don't know that I can count on them um, to do an aggressive effort uh, on that, but I hope that they will as well. Um, I think it's important for the integrity of the process and for the foundation, as I included, the foundation of our rules in, in total. Can I follow up on that? Of course. I'm unfamiliar with the, what happens if you violate FCC rules. What, what kinds of penalties would Netflix face? You've got multiple layers. Of, uh, it can be as simple as a sanction. It can be as simple as a letter from the commission saying, please don't do that again. Or it can go all the way to, uh, we get fines and, and monetary penalties that, that go with that. So you've got a, a range of options uh, that, that can go into, uh, and then depending on the scope of the activity, we can actually bar you from participating. But that would require a whole host of, of layers before we ever got to that point. Yes, sir. Mike Horney with the Free State Foundation. First off, thanks for coming to our event last week. Uh, I guess my question is a hypothetical. Uh, since the open internet rules do not apply to edge providers blocking or throttling content, what if an ISP were to pay, say, Netflix to block either its subscribers or other subscribers for competitive reasons? Um, would that be considered pay prioritization, or is that a violation? How does that work? Uh, interesting hypothetical, and I, I, I generally don't tackle these, but I'll, I'll give you a, a, a rough guess, and, and we'll go from there. I suspect that the commission, um, we all know the commission has reserved itself uh, complete authority under the general internet conduct rule to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, uh, to whomever it wants. So I suspect if it found that that were the occurrence, uh, it would deem itself authority to do whatever remedy it saw on any type of ISP that was, was, was conducting such behavior. Uh, and then, then, of course, the participant, whoever it was, it, whichever edge provider was participating, uh, would, would, would not be subject to such uh, similar rules. We have time for one more in the back. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm Philip Barenbroek with Public Knowledge, and I'm following up on the Netflix question. Of course. Um, there was uh, some back and forth at the Senate Commerce Oversight hearing earlier this month um, on uh, filings by providers uh, that might have conflicted with uh, SEC filings by providers about uh, the impact of Title II on broadband de deployment and investment. Um, are you going to be looking into that as well? Sure. So your your question is, uh, did they make misrepresentation? Did the ISPs make different representations to both Congress uh, and and to the Commission? First of all, to the, the Congress, they have their own investigation and they they uh, investigation authority and can look into that as well. I suspect, though, you're going to find uh, in looking into this, you'll find that the companies themselves have differentiated the the, the performance uh, that they have articulated to Wall Street uh, and their behavior in terms of what their dollars are. If you see what uh, just happened in the AT&T scenario, where at &T said, at t said, gee, Mr. Chairman, we noticed the comments you just made about our business. You're actually misinterpreting what we actually have said, and here's how it breaks down. I think you'll, you'll find that uh, to be a little bit more, uh, more uh, uh, differentiating than, than what uh, the simple comments have been made, that there's two different uh, variables being presented. So uh, we will look at I will look at anything that's presented as best I can. I don't have the resources that, that the commission at, at full does. Uh, and I only wish that they would uh, do more that I'd like them to do, but they don't tend to. Uh, maybe someday. Uh, please join me in thanking the commissioner. Thank you.
vraiment. Uh, we're quickly going to rearrange the stage and uh, set up for the panel, at which point Rob and the panel will, will take the stage. to apologize for that here. Do it. You want to introduce yourselves briefly? Sure. You want me to go first? All right. Are you ready to go first? Yes. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, <coughs> my name is Rob Pegarero. I've been writing about tech policy since I had a lot fewer gray hairs for many different publications. Mm -hmm. And most of those years have been writing about the FCC and the, the role it plays in regulating the communications technologies we use. Uh, we'll let each of our panelists introduce themselves and then we'll get right into this and we'll leave about 15 minutes for your questions, which will hopefully be in the form of questions. I'm Fred Campbell with Technology, and uh, once upon a time was Chief of the Wireless Bureau at the FCC and, and legal advisor to uh, former Chairman Kevin Martin. Uh, I'm Meredith Rose. I'm an attorney at Public Knowledge, um, and I work primarily on uh, privacy and telecom regulatory issues. My name is Will Reinhardt. I am the Director of Technology Innovation Policy here at American Action Forum, and I focus mainly on telecommunications issues, but also a decent amount on privacy, uh, digital trade, and then also a little bit on the um, kind of disruptive tech space as well. Okay, so we have to start with uh, the FCC net neutrality, the Title II rules that have been in effect. Yeah. When that happened, I really figured that by this time we would have seen somebody dragged in for a formal hearing, a formal investigation. Why has, if you want to put it this way, the, the jackboot of the regulatory state <laughs> not come down yet? When, when does that happen? Uh, I think that, you know, uh, just looking at this from a purely pragmatic perspective, um, I think the FCC has been um, trying to be pragmatists about this and that uh, they knew that this was going to come up in a court challenge and it's currently sort of working its way through the court system right now. Um, and I think just looking, that we're very confident um, that the FCC will prevail in this case, um, you know, just as a purely practical matter, it makes a lot more sense to sort of let that play out than to have to, you know, to have a bunch of hearings and then have to backtrack on that if, you know, it goes the other way. So once the court rolls, then the hammer really comes down. It's, it's entirely possible. I think we'll have to wait and see. But also to a certain extent, I mean, also you have heard um, that a number of companies, especially, and I know we're going to talk a little bit later about zero rating, but they already have gone in front of the commission. There has been some of these, these uh, discussions that, uh, that to a certain degree, even though it hasn't been really, as you said, you know, the, the hammer hasn't been brought down. The, the conversation, it seems to be that, that, that the FCC actually did bring in a number of companies to talk about their zero rating plans and, and if this does or does not violate the uh, network neutrality uh, order. And, and so I, I think it's already kind of happening, but it's just in a much more, a, uh, it's, it's, it's via soft power and not the kind of hard power discretion that, that people are, are looking for specifically. Well, and just uh, to sort of piggyback on that, I mean, a lot of these issues that have been coming up, things like zero rating, um, have really require a pretty robust, uh, you know, set of background knowledge. And so there's been a lot of, as you mentioned, um, bringing people in, asking questions. You know, you can't just have uh, net neutrality go into effect and then a week later start having ruling after ruling. There really has to be sort of a buildup and, and intelligence gathering and figuring out now that we're in this new regulatory regime, what are the big questions that we need to ask and how do we need to uh, apply this to broadband providers? Fred? I don't really have anything to add. Okay. So let's talk about zero rating, where the, the practice where the data cap you have on this device, your provider says, this particular site is not going to count. It's, it's been used in a, in a variety of cases. Facebook is doing this to spread internet access to the developing world, but not India, where the government said, nope, that violates our rules. Uh, and so far, the FCC seems to, be, seems to be deciding not to decide yet. Uh, their attitude is, well, let's see how this looks. And you have examples that range from, this is a T-Mobile phone, where I don't, all the streaming I do on Pandora doesn't count. And I think I'm okay with that as a customer. 
uh, if I watch Netflix on this phone, which I don't because it's kind of a small screen, that doesn't count either, but every other site gets lowered to a lower resolution, whether they like it or not. And then you have Verizon's implementation where Verizon said, you know, if you pay us, we will exempt you from the service. And the most public service to take advantage of this is, weirdly enough, Verizon's own video service, Go90. And that seems like a different, a different animal. How, how do you think the FCC should, should deal with those three different use cases? Uh, I think you actually framed it very well in that there's a lot of different um, sort of beasts that this zero rate fall into the zero rating header. Um, they're very fact specific. There's a lot of different concerns. Uh, one of the ones that we're very deeply concerned about is uh, Comcast Stream TV. Uh, partly because that takes place over a wired connection, um, and there's a lot of issues with data caps creating a false scarcity when you're dealing, especially with wired uh, broadband access. Um, and so, you know, public knowledge has put a petition at the FCC to examine uh, this, and as a, if nothing else, as a violation of their merger conditions uh, with NBC Universal. Um, and so, I think you know the the issue of zero rating. Uh, is one that is not going to go away, um, but because it's taken all of these different forms, some which raise, you know, all of which raise some concerns, some of which are more dire than others. Uh, I think the FCC is going to have to, you know, uh, look at this as a very um, fact-specific set of cases rather than sort of issue a, a very sweeping, you know, we don't like zero rating at all in any circumstances. I, I mean. I tend to think this this shows the the general fracture within the within the uh, regulatory within the regulatory apparatus that's been put up for network neutrality just writ large that you do have these instances where consumers clearly do benefit, and and you talked about this um, about binge on which is a bit of a different bit of a different system in in the sense that you know you get you get the ability to continue I mean you can switch binge on binge on if you would like they made just, it easier it used to be you would have to. Go like three clicks deep on their desktop customer service site, yeah. and now there's just an SMS shortcode. Exactly. Um, so there are clear benefits that that actually do accrue to consumers because of these, because of these, um, uh, because of these plans. And I, and I guess the the thing that really kind of irks me about the conversation is that, you know, when you, when you talk about free when you talk about free data, I, that's that's at core what we're talking about. Is we're talking about free data. The individuals get they get. Uh, part of their 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 um, their data plan, they get part of that taken out because of some other relationship that the that the ISP has to another you know to another content provider, and this is to a certain extent. I mean, this kind of free information is really what is at core about marketing and about advertising. The consumer, you know, the consumer being being the consumer of some sort of data does not have to pay for whatever that data may be. And this, this is, again, this is kind of the core concept behind advertising, behind marketing. And when you actually look at the individuals, look at the, the companies that are using these types of services in order to get, um, you know, in order to get uh, some, uh, some attention, a lot, there is at least a decent amount of these organizations, companies that are, that are new, that are new to, you know, new to services, that are new to video production. So to me, it, it Again, and I, I like this idea of differentiating between the different kinds of consumer data types and the c different types of plans. But at, at core, I worry that we're we're really putting this into a bucket that it probably doesn't need to be in. I think it's a mistake to uh, try to act too quickly on these types of situations. And history is a pretty good guide here. When um, over-the-air radio, AM radio, first began, there's a long history of you know, at least a decade or so, I think, of experimentation with what the business model was going to be. Some uh, uh, broadcasters tried to charge for the service. There was uh, an attempt to make money selling the radios. Ultimately, it ended up with an advertising model being the primary means of support because that's what turned out to be uh, best in that particular market at that time. Interestingly enough, however, uh, the FCC decided, well, we'll cement that in place, uh, which has turned out to be cemented in place now for, you know, close to 100 years, uh, by regulation, and we'll stop all experimentation. So in the early 50s, uh, I believe it was Zenith filed uh, an application at the FCC saying, hey, we'd like to do a subscription uh, television service and have subscription channels. A good potential competitor with cable, for example. And the FCC sat on it for around 16 years and finally said, no, can't do that. And then eventually they sort of said yes, but made the rule so restrictive uh, that it couldn't really happen. Now, I, I'm not suggesting I know 
you know, would that have been a successful service? I'm not sure. Could it have competed with cable? I, actually, with the DTV transition, probably, but I don't know. But what I am suggesting is, is it, it's very dangerous to innovation and competition for a regulator to think they've got the silver bullet. This is the way this market ought to develop, and we are therefore going to require that as a matter of law. So, for example, um, the ISPs who started to participate in the big, the emerging market for big data uh, could be like over-the-air radio and, and reduce costs for consumers on subscribing to ISPs. I mean, we, current market development is you get a lot of service for free by giving away your data uh, on a software side, uh, and you have to pay a monthly price for uh, an ISP connection. Uh, things like outlawing zero rating, the FCC's privacy proceeding are all aimed at cementing that particular business model into place. But what I don't see happening at the FCC is anybody asking the holistic normative question, which is, is that the model we actually want for time immemorial, and is it the best way to serve consumers? Uh, I'm suggesting that I don't think a regulatory agency actually can do that, but they're not even asking, is even worse, they're not asking the question. They're doing all of these things on a very piecemeal, very focused basis. So I I'm just saying zero rating is one small aspect of a much larger question that we really aren't tackling head on. I should note there's one other kind of zero rating which everyone seems to think is perfectly fine. Uh, with Sprint, with T-Mobile, a lot of prepaid providers, there's no actual data cap, but you get lower to edge speeds. So in that sense, any site that functions at a 200 kilobit per second wireless connection, use it all you want. And everyone seems to think that's okay. So it is a complicated issue. I've actually said something dangerous in public, which is I'm not actually sure how I feel about this. <laughs> I'll try to find some more value judgments for you about that. Um, Moving on with net neutrality, the other interesting part of this argument, people have said, this is going to suppress investment for our broadband providers. That is an interesting argument because we can prove it false. It's falsifiable, and that makes it an honest argument. The question is, at what point do we have enough data to say that, yes, this has caused AT&T, Comcast, Verizon, and their ilk to cancel all these planned expansions, or, nope, they haven't really slowed down. They've actually increased their build-out. When, when can we say, this experiment is done, let's move on to the next argument? I think the data that's come out so far, I mean, to the extent that um, they can even reasonably make these claims because they are also similarly very close to the, uh, the Title II ruling, all the data has pointed to the fact that the investment has not slowed down. Um, all of the slowdowns, uh, actually Free Press did a very interesting study uh, towards the end of 2015, which basically showed that all of the slowdowns that came in investment were predictable um, and had been predicted several years out due to other uh, intrinsic factors and development plans. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that we can tell whether or not there is any uh, investment slowed in happening, and again, this is something that we'll have to, we'll have to you know, keep an eye on as, as the years roll by. Um, I think that there is a tendency uh, within, uh, sort of within regulated uh, industries to uh, have chicken little syndrome uh, in many cases, where any sort of new regulation is met with screams and cries of the sky is falling. Um, and that happens, obviously, more in, in certain proceedings than others. There was actually a very interesting article that was published uh, just this month in the, I believe, the Harvard uh, Law Review for uh, Harvard Environmental Law Review, uh, which dealt specifically with the context of, um, I believe, oil companies. But it examined uh, the discrepancy between what regulated entities said to regulators and then what they said, often in the same week in investment reports, to their investors. Uh, and on investment calls, and there is a pretty large discrepancy. Um, and so I think that you know anyone who has uh, been in this field or any really any regulatory field long enough knows that you know you have to you have to sort of discount that there is there is in all politics some small degree of theatrics that's going to you know you have to discount it a little bit. Yeah, I, you know there's there's a lot a lot of truth to that. Um, you know, various policies uh, impact uh, investment to different degrees, and you can argue about whether it's really substantial in any particular case or at the margin. So there is some of that. Uh, you know, regarding the timing, I mean, we have some uh, 
historical basis, again, that's very useful in looking at this question uh, that gives us around a decade of data, and that's, that's the European conclusion in, in 2013 that uh, the unbundling approach, uh, highly regulatory unbundled approach to broadband that they implemented in 2002, uh, the same year uh, the FCC Comcast uh, modem, cable modem order came out, uh, you know, so the U.S. went deregulatory at that time, and the uh, European Union went the other direction. Well, in 2013, the European Union did a pretty comprehensive analysis. Their staff did an analysis of relative investment in fiber in Europe versus the USA and uh, uh, Asia, I think primarily in the Southeast Asia, and concluded that their policies had discouraged investment in comparison to the U.S., and Southeast Asia, and actually changed their unbundling policy uh, European Union-wide. So to me, that's pretty strong evidence of what we're likely to see in the long term. Now, I mean, to Meredith's point, it's not that there was zero investment in the European Union. We're talking about maximizing investment, you know, relative uh, level of investment. And the second thing I would say is, you know, the, the free press study, in my view, is, is flawed. But even just putting that aside, you know, I believe Chairman Wheeler recently said, no, no, investment hasn't changed. Well, one of the details that's not mentioned in that are the regulatory conditions that the agency has creatively used to ensure that at least in the short term, i.e. the remainder of his chairmanship, investment's unlikely to drop as substantially as it might otherwise. One example, uh, in the FCC order approving the merger of AT&T and DirecTV, the FCC expressly conditioned uh, authorization of that merger on AT&T maintaining the 16 billion, I believe it was, in investment that it had planned to do before the debt neutrality order came out. So to put the sequ sequence of events in place, AT&T had a plan to invest in fiber and announced it. Net neutrality is announced uh, that it's going to go Title II, and they say, well, wait a second, I'm not sure we actually are going to do that. But the FCC said, no, you will do that if you want your merger approved. So when Chairman Wheeler says, hey, look, AT&T is investing just as much this year as they did last year, well, that's uh, the direct result of uh, his own uh, regulatory authority. Uh, it's not necessarily a market-based decision that's that reactive to uh, the regulatory environment. When does that condition expire? Well, it was, it, I can't remember how long exactly AT&T planned to, to do that investment, whether it's a year or two, but it's keyed to whatever their existing plans were. Basically, those plans became law. So one other comment I think is important within this discussion is even with the open internet order that we, you know, that everyone here has been analyzing pretty, um, uh, pretty clearly over the last year and a half or so, uh, even within that, there was, there's, I think, a big discrepancy between what the agency said and other analysts who have looked at the time period where Title II was applied to telephone systems. So one of the things that's, that's actually very intriguing is when you look at the telephone system itself under the Title II regime that existed for, for quite many years, um, you have to compare that against something that is not regulated. And this is, this is ultimately the issue that we're talking about here. If the entire industry is regulated in a way that is, um, that is onerous, and I think that we haven't really seen a huge dip, I mean, for all the reasons that have been mentioned before, but also because a lot of the potentially the bad stuff hasn't really come yet. Um, but you have to compare it against something else, and there really is no comparison currently for a regulated and unregulated industry, and so that's just very, very difficult. But I would mention within this, you know, both the Democrats and the Republicans recently came together to actually press forward a bill that exempted a number of small ISPs, which suggests to a certain extent that there is at least some sort of regulatory um, compliance cost that is that is implicated within the network neutrality order that that regardless of everything else there still is a cost here that that is involved now whether or not that uh, ISPs should bear that cost for greater values I think is up for discussion as well uh, but I but to be to be at least for my own position I mean there's obviously some other concerns that, that Fred and, and Meredith also pointed out but but the the core problem here that we're actually facing is that we we haven't seen we haven't seen the kinds of stuff that, I mean, a lot of analysts worry about 
being potentially negative for consumers, for investment, for growth. Well, let's Which talk, isn't to say that it, it potentially couldn't happen in the future. Well, let's talk about what you just mentioned, the issue of the privacy regulations. The FCC is going to vote to start a rulemaking process. It's not like they're going to have a bunch of rules to get enacted into with the force of law on Thursday. That would regulate and limit what an ISP could do with your data the same way that um, your wireless provider cannot sell off your calling record to third-party marketers without your permission, your ISP, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, they would have to let you opt out of them sharing their data with their own affiliates. With other companies, you would have to opt into it. So the, the, your provider would have to say, if you do this, if you let us you know, anonymize your browsing history and sell ads against that, you'll get some kind of reward. T-shirt, $10 discount, unclear. <laughs> um, does that, you seem to be saying that leaves no room to innovate, that people will not take them up on that opt-in. Are there precedents to suggest otherwise? Well, so wait a second. I, I wouldn't say it leaves no room. I think it creates a market distortion. And market distortions are you know, a form of market failure in terms of, I believe, classic economic thinking. I'm not an economist, but I've read a lot of economic books. And it, it'll distort the market in the following way. So th there are studies that show, for example, one reason Microsoft has struggled with Bing is that it, the larger amount of data that you've collected over time, and I'm going to use search engines just as an analogous example, you know, the more accurate your searches become because you've got a bigger data set to work with. And so Bing has had a very difficult time trying to make their search engine as, as generally accurate as Google because uh, to the extent Google has a 90% market share or 80 or whatever it currently is, they're every day collecting more data than their competitors. And the size of your data set affects the quality of the outcome. So in other words, uh, no matter how much money Microsoft throws at the problem, they really can't fix it unless Google sells them their data set, which they're not going to do. So uh, here's where it becomes a market distortion. If the same opt-in and opt-out requirements don't apply to other big data collectors in the internet marketplace, and the FCC is proposing that they will not apply, uh, even to the extent that ISPs can innovate in the sense of try to get into this market and they'll get opt-ins and the like, Every customer that opts out is you know, going to reduce the size of their data set. It's going to reduce its accuracy, if you will, or its value, uh, putting accuracy aside, uh, compared to potential competitors in big data. So there's a normative question here. Uh, aside from privacy, there's a normative question. Um, so Do we I want competition in this market? And if so, among which competitors, and again, the FCC's not even asking that question. They're taking a statute that was adopted when there was a telephone monopoly and applying it to a market that has competition. We can argue about the level of competition, but there's clearly we not will. a monopoly. <laughs> and, and not asking any difficult questions about why are we doing this and what do we want this market to look like. I actually did want to respond to that. I think that um, the the sort of Google as boogeyman argument that has kept coming up, and then, oh, well, Google can do this. Oh, well, Facebook can do this. Oh, there's a couple of different counterpoints to that. One is that Google and Facebook are free services. Um, if I don't want Google and Facebook to collect my data, you can have an argument about how easy it is to actually functionally opt out of that, but there is a, a choice. Uh, you know, I have a choice in my apartment in Northwest DC of one internet service provider, uh, that is Comcast. I must pass all of my data through their hands. Uh, secondly, the argument that, oh, well, because Google and Facebook are able to do this without any kind of opt-in, opt-out mechanism, so should I as an ISP, presumes that, uh, you know, I should, I have a right to move uninterfered uh, to subsidize a new business venture with my old business venture. If Google wants to get into being an ISP, they have to play by the same rules as all ISPs. If uh, ISPs decide that they want to have, start having a, a separate marketing arm, that's fine, and they will play by those rules. But they cannot use data that is gleaned as their dominant position in one market, in one totally different business model, into uh, dominance in a secondary business model. If they want to gather data like Google, like Facebook, they can do that, but they cannot do that by abusing their dominance. 
uh, by having the sole connection into a consumer's home. So that's oh. that's really where our concern lies. So I am not the lawyer on the panel, but part of the reason why we're here is that there was a reclassification of internet services in a way that that had we gone with a different method, you know, the 706 method, section 706, we wouldn't be having this conversation purely just because the the rules would, uh, I would assume if they, if, if uh, the commission went with the 706 option, it probably, they probably wouldn't try to apply this. Um, that being said, you know, when you actually look at the historical record for these rules, for the CPNI rules, they were mainly made under, from my understanding, from a uh, position of competition and not necessarily of privacy specifically. The point was that there was a whole bunch of ancillary information that was related to consumers that gave the, uh, the incumbents a leg up potentially in marketing services and a whole bunch of data issues, just generally speaking. And so they were limited to allow competitors to come in and provide services, to provide competitive services for the incumbents. And so basically it was just saying, okay, well, no one can use this data. Um, now, that means that at least originally the intent wasn't to limit specifically privacy for privacy's sake, but more that the intent was to limit the collection of data for competitive purposes. Now, on this competitive point, we do know, at least from the privacy sphere, that there clearly is a cost involved in limiting, um, uh, in limiting whatever data could be potentially collected. Uh, we know, for example, that the FTC started a new round of um, COPPA, and this is the, um, this is the uh, Child's Privacy Protection Act. Um, they, they put an entirely new system in place, or you know, they, they revamped the system because there was a cost associated with COPPA. So there clearly will be a cost associated. The question is, what effect will that have on the market? And one of the things that probably will be affected by the market is new entrants. Now, new entrants could potentially use this as a way to, you know, to gain new consumers, people they potentially would be interested in their products. Um, this has generally been, especially when you look at the uh, privacy research angle, this is, this is almost universally accepted, that there is probably going to be a, a structural change for, at least on the privacy side, that there will probably be a structural change if you have um, specific regulatory structures put in place for, for privacy. You would assume something very similar would probably apply also to ISPs. And what that practically means is that the largest players are able to deal with this problem. But the smallest players, the people who potentially would be entrants, do, cannot deal with it, and nor can they really, um, nor can they leverage it in order to to get into the market. I'd like to break down two things, Mary sure. said. I'd like to break her th points into two parts. One was a point about, I assume, vertical market leveraging, which I don't think is really applicable here. Uh, it's not applicable unless the person doing the leveraging has market power. And it's a very interesting example because Google has leveraged its clear dominance in search, for example, with Android. So it will do in its contracts, it will have provisions that say, you have to have our search engine on your home page, for example, or you can't use these features of Android. This is well known and well reported on. So that is an example of doing exactly what Meredith said is a bad thing. Uh, Secondly, her point about dominance, and she mentioned wireline, she, I noticed she didn't talk about wireless. So I would say there are four nationwide wireless carriers in this country. Uh, the top two, uh, whether you look at revenue or subscriber numbers, I think combined, it's still around 60% approximately of the market, meaning there's a 40% shared between the other two and then the handful of, you know, the there might be a large number of them with the smaller providers. Uh, those who are uh, collecting data, uh, Google for example, there are two mobile operating systems that are gatekeepers, as in every user of one of these devices that uses it to access the internet has to do so through an operating system that can and does collect data uh, about what you're doing. And uh, between Apple's iOS and Google's Android, uh, and they have about a 96% market share. And the next biggest competitor, Windows Phone, is currently below 3%. Does anyone have a Windows Phone in this room? <laughs> Please. <do>. So <laughs> This is DC, of course. <laughs> so wait a second. When I hear, wow, these ISPs are going to leverage their market dominance uh, to uh, collect data, I think, 
wait a second, don't we have a much more dominant part of the wireless market uh, that we're, again, the FCC is not even asking the question. It's as if they don't care. So I would actually like to respond sort of to both here. Um, so one, as far as uh, operating systems go, I think that is genuinely a very difficult edge case uh, for privacy concerns. Um, you know, we, first off, we don't really know whether the FCC is going to examine this or not until we see the NPRM. Um, we haven't heard anything about it uh, in the, you know, the publicly released lead up points, but it's entirely possible. Um, and I think that there is a, a legitimate argument for all of the data that I must hand to my ISP, I must also hand to my operating system. Um, you know, and, and to the extent that that's used to cross subsidize other markets and prevent, uh, provides um, you know, very serious privacy concerns, I think that is something that we need to have a discussion on. Uh, right now we're focusing on ISPs because that is very clearly where the FCC's authority falls. Um, and you know, at this point, there, there is a line of thinking that if we don't get all of this at once, if we don't solve all privacy concerns at once, then what's the point of doing any of them? Um, and it's letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. And right now, you know, we're trying to uh, deal where the FCC's authority is clearest. Um, and you know, we welcome a conversation on, on sort of more gray area cases like operating systems. Um, secondly, actually, I just wanted to point out uh, as a historical note, the history of Section 222 as a, um, a competition versus a privacy concern. Uh, actually, so we released a, this is my obligatory plug for the public knowledge white paper. Uh, it's about 100 pages of light beach reading um, on the history of Section 222. Are, are there pictures at least? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Um, I wish. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, many of my colleagues uh, worked on this, uh, you know, Harold Feld, myself, Charles Dwan, a whole bunch of PKers. Um, and part of what we get into is the history of Section 222, and it's actually very interesting uh, from the Senate, and if you read the Senate and the House reports, uh, the House very much looked at this as a personal privacy issue, the Senate very much looked at it as a competition issue, and then they sort of synthesized it um, in the end result. So there is, you know, there was in part of its legislative history and express consent, uh, or express concern for uh, individual consumer privacy on top of all of the competitive concerns, which we also think are very pressing. Um, you know, and I think uh, among public interest groups, public knowledge is a little bit uh, unique in that we, we also try to focus a lot on the competitive concerns um, that come up with uh, the Section 222 and its application to uh, broadband internet access services. Um, but there is, there is a history for sort of both aspects of it. I think that the commission would do best to, to address both of them. Let me ask a, a fact check question of everyone here and then we can move on to the next topic. How many people have more than two residential broadband providers offering at least 10 megabits of download service available where they live? More than I thought, okay. So you've all gotten the equivalent 500 pounds of mailings from Verizon and Comcast over the years? <laughs> yeah. I think that there's an issue, there's a regulatory issue there for the EPA in terms of how many <laughs> trees have to die <laughs> as part of this marketing campaign. Um, We've been talking about competition. Let's talk about that. Another area where the FCC has been moving its, to use its Title II authority, state limitations, not outright bans on municipal broadband systems, the FCC has said. You know, this is an area where we do have some jurisdiction. A state can ban it outright, but if you put in a lot of ticky-tack limitations, as is the case in Tennessee and North Carolina, then we feel that we have the authority. That's going to court. Should the FCC win, how many people do you think will have another source of broadband, say two years from now, and then five years from now, since some of these systems have not done so well in the market? You know, it's, it's kind of difficult to tell. Um, I think uh, municipal broadband is interesting because, it, uh, because of the state level, you know, very restrictive uh, regulations that we haven't seen a ton of experimentation with it. Um, you know, it's, it's fundamentally, it's a, it's a municipal development program bringing in, and, and when we talk about muni broadband or municipal broadband, that spans a whole range of topics. That's everything from actually building the facilities under the auspices of the city and then leasing out access to providing tax incentives to bring in a second broadband provider uh, to public-private partnerships. It's this whole range of uh, activity that we're, you know, hoping to see um, at the outcome of this case, provided it goes favorably for the FCC. Um, so I think it's a little impossible to tell. Um, I think if this ends up uh, being very appealing to a lot of municipalities, then I think it could be a huge boon for um, especially rural areas where they have very difficult times getting service or they're reliant on things like satellite broadband, which is a really, uh, you know, a very subpar service in terms of the kinds of um, uses that most people put broadband to nowadays. So I think it's, it's kind of a wait and see issue right now. Um, I mean, we're very encouraged and we would like to see uh, a lot of municipalities taking things really into their own hands and addressing their very specific needs. I, I would say, again, Europe provides a, an interesting example. I 
keep using it in part because Europe's reputation is generally that it's more regulatory than the U.S., but yet I, I find in all of, well, most of their recent decisions that they're adopting less regulatory approaches than the current FCC. So when it comes to government-sponsored uh, broadband, the EU has also issued an order placing relatively strict limitations on it. Uh, their findings are that, uh, and, and from specific cases and examples that they had, that uh, government involvement in providing broadband tends to uh, deter investment by private companies, and they've taken the position generally that they prefer private investment to publicly owned facilities in this case. It's a much broader argument uh, to say, you know, you could have an argument about, well, government owned facilities are better than privately owned, but there are a couple of things I'd draw your attention to. Uh, one, government officials have constitutional and other types of immunities that don't apply to private companies. So when something does go wrong, like Flint, Michigan, uh, good luck suing your local officials for that. Uh, you probably either, you don't have a lawsuit and, and unlikely that there would be any criminal action. Private companies, in other words, have uh, different incentives and arguably much better incentives to serve the public well because they're subject to greater liability. Uh, and uh, I'll just, leave there. we could go on and on about that, but I'm very skeptical that uh, the public interest is well served by a broad federal preemption on state laws uh, re regarding the deployment of municipal broadband systems. Well, it's an interesting, actually, you, just, you said something that interested me, which is that, um, you know, the European report has found that uh, the, the real drawback is that it deters private investment. And I think you really have to look at this as a difference in how we define serving the public interest. Um, I think there's an argument to be made that serving the public interest is best done by robust private investment. On the other hand, the public interest is also served when people get online and they get online with, uh, you know, robust broadband connections. And so you know, a lot of times we're talking about areas like uh, Unalaska, Alaska, which is, first off, there's a town named Unalaska, um, which is, uh, I believe, out in the Aleutian Islands, um, you know, which is one of the more remote places in the United States. Uh, and obviously, when you're on an island and when you're otherwise geographically remote, it's going to be very difficult to get broadband out there. Now, obviously, I'm using this purely as a hypothetical as an example of a very I'm going to look up where it is right now. I've never heard of this place. <laughs> On Alaska? Can you see Russia from there? Possibly. OK. Uh, <laughs> I know it's come up in the context of environmental law a few times, which is sort of why it popped to mind. Um, you know, but you have these very rural communities in which there is there just is no private investment to deter. Um, frankly, there are there's little to no interest in serving these communities because of the huge cost of building out. And if there's been a market failure in reaching some of these individuals, then you know we think by all means these individuals should be able to help themselves. So the one thing I would I would mention, which you kind of actually pointed out in the very beginning of this, which is that the issue of banning outright a municipal broadband project has already uh, largely been dealt with by the Supreme Court under Nixon. So it's easier for a state to actually say, no, there should not be any broadband, uh, municipal broadband provider as compared to what's actually currently going through, which is a discussion about what the terms and negotiated agreements uh, for those broadband providers at the, uh, at the municipal broadband providers at the local level. So there is this kind of interesting, there's this kind of interesting reaction that could happen that if you saw a lot of, you know, if there was a kind of a, a negative reaction by the state legislatures on the on this issue, uh, they might actually just outright ban ban uh, municipal broadband just purely, and that actually would be a that would actually be legal. That is, you know, saying that the FCC, if the FCC's preemption preemption case actually uh, actually survives legal muster. And I think there's actually some really good reasons probably why it doesn't survive legal muster. And I'd actually highly suggest one of my former colleague, uh, his name is Baron Zoki, wrote a really interesting article about this going through a number of the issues on Medium. Um, about the, there is another similar issue, and there, you know, there's obviously this policy question that, that's, that's attached on and implicated with this conversation. So you know, setting aside the legal issues, which I think are still, there's still a number of concerns on the legal side. When you actually look at, and so we actually did some of this work here at AAF, and when you look at municipal broadband providers and you compare them to uh, national national price data, which um, I got the national price data from uh, New America Foundation and then also a, a price index, when you actually compare the two, 
when you look at it, the it's about 20 to 50 percent, depending on your price index. It's about 20, 20 to 50 percent more expensive to consume as a municipal broadband provider, as compared to just a normal private, uh, a normal private uh, broadband provider. Now, this could tell us one of two things. One thing it could say is that these areas where they're being built out and they're just more expensive. Or it could also say that, that those providers, that the municipal broadband providers just aren't, because they're not in the business of doing this, that they're not, as a, they're not able to provide the service as cheaply as, as, a, as a private provider. Um, there's a bigger question, I think, related to municipal broadband and whether or not it's beneficial for communities, which there's really good research to suggest that it's actually, that it actually probably just is a wash, just generally speaking, that there aren't, you know, even though you do have these cases and the big case that consistently comes down is uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, which I will be visiting tomorrow, I think tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow, um, to actually talk to some of the uh, local providers and, you know, have a, have a conversation about this. But when you actually look at, at good empirical analysis, and the only really good empirical analysis is, is by, interestingly enough, one of my former roommates um, who did this as his thesis project, <laughs> and he compared he compared cities that had municipal broadband before and afterwards. Uh, there was a negligible amount of new uh, business growth, and but there was a positive amount of of um, of, of uh, government uh, government employees. Uh, and as far as beneficial for the long term, it, it's just it's it's not clear one way or the other. So it probably isn't the case that this is a huge lift in a way that other things could probably be a huge lift. Uh, the one thing that I always keep on coming back to, and, and maybe we'll discuss, discuss this a little bit in Q&A, but there's a lot of other things that, that municipalities could, in fact, do to help individuals, and help consumers get better broadband. The one thing that, that is clear is that when Google Fiber first came into Kansas City, it changed the relationship very clearly between the provider and then also the local municipality and how they're con contracting out. Um, Google Fiber provides this long, you know, it's like a six page list of things you could do in order to, you know, provide broadband much quicker. And I'd actually like to see the FCC try to do something along those lines to see what it can provide as, you know, what, what as a, um, as a regulatory agency, if it can, if it can, you know, put together best practices. Um, so I think that there's a lot of other things that, that the FCC could be doing beyond municipal broadband. And I just, I, I'm not particularly convinced, at least the data doesn't convince me, that this is a, a massive, huge change that could be beneficial to consumers. There are other things that could be beneficial to consumers, and I actually would prefer that we focus on that. My own take on this, for what it's worth, is that having grown up in New Jersey and living in Virginia, I'm not really comfortable with state legislatures being the, the source of all wisdom on this, or, or really too many other public policy considerations. But, I mean, the cities themselves are a creature right. of the state. So this is the other part, you know, the, the kind of the, this 900-pound gorilla, at least for me, is that the FCC is acting in lieu of states. I mean, that clearly is what, what they're trying to do here. Um, I think that, for me, is a much worrying and larger um, uh, change within the administration to actually take far more power and to really push the bounds of, of, of their power under 706, which I think is probably the case. So we're talking about what can the SEC do to increase competition. One thing it's starting to do right now is a very difficult task, getting people who got their wireless spectrum for free to give it up. This is the incentive auction under which TV stations can decide we're not using all the spectrum we're allocated, we're not putting out four DTV channels over the air, maybe we can share spectrum with a the neighbor. They get to say what price they would accept this film were to take it off their hands. Wireless carriers can say we would pay this much for this spectrum and at the end of this complicated interlocking machinery moving around, you get more uh, and hopefully better wider covering uh, wireless services. How do you grade the FCC's implementation of this so far? I actually think on the technical details of the auction rules themselves, I don't mean the policy decisions around reserve spectrum and, and some of those things, but I think you know, the, the staff has done an excellent job, it, it appears, uh, implementing a, a really complicated software package. These are the kind of things that kept me awake at night when I was uh, doing the 700 megahertz auction at the Wireless Bureau. But it's, it seems like, they, you know, presumably they've got a system that works. Uh, they've got a lot of good procedures in place, and the thing is moving ahead, and they actually kept it basically on schedule. So, you know, that's very impressive. Uh, you know, I, I think... I think the policy uh, results 
will probably be mixed, uh, but we'll have to wait and see how, how that turns out. And then, and then you have the inevitable lack of comparison problem. I'm sure that's not a technical term, <laughs> but, but as, as Will pointed out, I mean, spectrum bands tend to be somewhat unique. The market environment when the auction occurs is, is you know, unique. It's very hard to compare across auctions, and so you know it, it'll be hard to say whether this was a better way of doing it, for example, than you know a, a, a proposal that some have made, and, and I think I, I I think could very well have worked, which is to just give broadcasters the right to use their spectrum for mobile services and sell it on the secondary market. I mean, the argument against that is, you know, the argument for the incentive auction is, well, there can be holdouts and it could take up to 10 years for the spectrum to get transitioned. Well, this plan was floated in 2009. It's now 2016 and the broadcasters have 39 months to transition once the auction is done. Just in time to start the ATSC 3.0 transition. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> you're looking at about a decade either way. Now, I'm not saying the, I know the other way would have worked better. I'm suggesting we won't really know. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, these things are just, they tend to be one-off events. It's really, really hard to say. And on the issue of repacking with the 39th month, 39 month uh, timeline, I mean, there have been concerns of whether or not everyone can meet that. I mean, one of the things that I've seen uh, pressed again and again is that the actual technical staff itself that would be that would be doing the transition there's only like 14 teams that are doing this in the United States and that technically speaking the amount of time it actually will take them to go through each of the different cities means practically speaking the 30 month 39 month timeline is actually just difficult purely um, you know on the spectrum reserve issue that is something that we've we've written extensively about it does worry me that there was a, you know, that there was a large uh, carve out that essentially was taken away from the two largest providers. Um, I understand the reason why that was implemented for, you know, for so-called competitive concerns. Um, we've written extensively on this in a number of papers. Uh, I do worry that that will limit the amount of, of uh, you know, of broadcasters that actually do come to the table because they're, you know, this is a dynamic relationship. This is the first time that we've seen both a, you know, the buyers and the sellers come to the table at the same time. Uh, and that to me is worrying that, that, you know, the quote unquote sellers in this space know that they may not be able to uh, obtain uh, a high enough price. And that, you know, it's kind of convoluted in a way that I'm describing here, but essentially because there's limitations on the spectrum, on the Spectrum Reserve, which is what you know, my colleague, my, the president of this organization, Doug Holtzikin, in the back here has actually written extensively about, that there are concerns that will limit the auction proceeds, that will limit all of the, you know, all of the, um, the benefits that would have come from this and would also you know, limit people from actually coming to the table. I mean, just speaking very generally, um, you know, public knowledge, and this is actually, this is not a topic I follow particularly closely. Uh, I will say that it is, uh, you know, exciting for, certain subset of people who are very interested in spectrum um, you know so if you're if you're a geek like me things you, only said in DC yeah exactly <laughs> um, you know, I mean so generally we it's gonna be very interesting to see how this goes like you said this is the first time that this has happened and so you know there's a, obviously there's gonna be a lot of uh, to, to borrow the phrase unknown unknowns uh, that are gonna crop out of the proceeding um, you know generally I think that uh, we as an organization really uh, would have liked a little bit stronger uh, rules protecting, uh, you know, small broadcasters and and uh, smaller competition. And also, we're always pro, uh, you know, sort of large swaths of unlicensed um, because we think there's a lot of innovation that goes on in that space. Um, but generally, you know, we're we're interested to see how this plays out. Um, we've you know been involved in the process a lot uh, thus far, and we're you know going to be watching it as it goes forward. Okay, second to last question. Will here has advanced a critique of the Lifeline broadband program. The, the, we're going to expand subsidies from giving people phone service, how exciting is that, to actual usable broadband, yeah. at least 10 megs or more. Uh, one of your interesting critiques is that the 2013 census survey found that only really 2 million Americans said price was keeping them from getting on the internet. Do we agree that number is, is correct? What do you? So that comes from Pew, to be very, very specific. Pew, okay, um, sorry, not. And there's... Census. To be very honest, this is kind of a weird, this is a weird thing for Pew because Pew recently did a survey in the end of 2015, which showed that something like 33% of individuals are actually, um, that they would cite price as being the limits, the reason why they're not on uh, internet. And yet, 
what's really interesting about the Pew survey is they didn't ask the same questions from 2013 to 2015. So all the 2013 questions were not included in 2015. And so I actually had to do a little bit of calculations assuming that the 2013 data applied to 2015 because questions about reliability, you know, usability, uh, those are, are obviously very, very important. And if you're not bringing them up in a survey, it's actually, it's... Uh, the next time I see Lee Rainey at Pew, I'll pass on your concerns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so on that, to be very honest, I mean, I think that is the big, the big question. This is something I've written about extensively. You know, we've done some reports on this. And the, the, the end result, the, the, the big question is still about effectiveness. Um, GAO said that, that Lifeline needs some sort of effectiveness mechanism. They need some sort of mechanism to figure out, you know, is this a beneficial program or not? Hasn't been implemented. Doesn't seem like it's going to be implemented. Uh, we don't even know if the last program for telephone service, fixed telephone service, is actually beneficial. And there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that this isn't the best way to get consumers on. So there's a lot of very serious questions about definition and about evaluation that have not been answered. And it doesn't seem like that it's going to be answered in this, uh, this recent, uh, this new order. So how, how would you all restructure this to better solve the actual real problem that some people would like to get online but can't, whether it's price or just no one is connecting where they live? Well, I think actually one of the things that sort of gets left out of the discussion very frequently is that a lot of uh, a lot of unstable subscribers um, that are involved in the not, lifeline not program. mentally unstable. Well, also, also possibly as with the they're, general they're population. In my email. Um, but uh, no, so consumers who find that they cannot afford uh, from month to month uh, to maintain their subscription rates, and it often costs more for them to drop and then sign back on after a month or two off than it does to sustain the subscription throughout. Um, and so one of the things that we would like the Lifeline program to focus on is to keep those people connected, um, especially if you are at a particularly unstable point in your life, if you have to drop for, say, you find unsteady work hours, or there are other economic circumstances that is arguably when you need broadband access the most. Um, you know, we're very happy that the program generally is being upgraded. Uh, it is a 30-year-old program. Uh, you know, it's a Reagan administration program, and it's sort of been upgraded in fits and starts. Um, and we have you know, collectively come to the social agreement that connectivity to broadband internet access is really just absolutely necessary to function in society. I mean, you can't apply to most federal government jobs without having an online connection. Um, you must do it through USA Jobs. So you know, we're, we're excited to see that this is actually being uh, modernized. I think there's obviously a very long and robust debate about the best ways in which to do this, um, which we are obviously very active participant. I don't. I'll admit I have not studied this particular issue as much as Will or probably Meredith as well. Uh, but I do have a, a general, I mean, this thing was supposed to be about FCC reform, right? And we've talked mostly substantive issues, which is great. But I, <laughs> I, I do think from a sort of a FCC reform perspective, uh, one thing the agency started to do under previous Chairman Janikowski that I thought was, you know, something that was just amazing and a wonderful idea, and has since come under Wheeler completely abandoned, was uh, in, in their uh, universe, and his, Janikowski's universal service reform, you know, Connect America fund order that kind of kicked off the whole bringing uh, these programs into the broadband era. You know, the FCC actually installed performance metrics. You know, private companies, you, know, you can argue about performance metrics like anything else, you know, and their value and the like, but it, pr private companies generally, uh, when they spend money and, and initiate a program, they want to make sure it's actually accomplishing the goals they've set for it, and they'll do performance. They'll come up with metrics in advance, like what are our outcomes and what do we want to see actually happen here? And that happened. Maybe first time ever, not 100% sure, but there actually were performance, uh, a commitment to performance metrics in that order. And it was, that's a very good step towards FCC reform. And, and it's the kind of thing, you know, all, all types of subsidy programs are subject to fraud. Uh, you know, virtually anything is subject to fraud. But performance metrics are one sort of way to, to keep a, a, a lid on that. And I'll give one specific example of, you know, net neutrality. The, the theory in the net neutrality order is the virtuous circle, which is that by having these hard and fast bright line rules, we will promote more broadband deployment and all these good things. Uh, you know, and it, time could be too short, but this is sort of the counterpoint to the investment example. Uh, 
where Wheeler says, hey, there's been no adverse impact on investment, the counterpoint would be, well, in your most recent uh, broadband deployment report, you said it's, it's still not good enough and it's, it's still what, not reasonable and timely under the statute a year later. So apparently there's been no positive change from the virtuous circle either. And so <laughs> by performance metrics, you know, if, for example, net neutrality is supposed to actually promote broadband deployment, has the rate of broadband deployment increased since the rules were adopted? And if not, are the rules actually doing anything? Uh, and I think that principle, by the way, it goes beyond that. I mean, it, could be, it should be applied to uh, regulations generally. Are they actually doing what the regulators say they're supposed to be doing? Th there's actually, in most cases, no process in place to actually try to make that determination. Last question before we open it up to the audience. What would you like to see the SEC do to improve competition that it has not or has done inadequately or too slowly so far? I'll take this one. <laughs> First off, they need to have some form of coherent competition policy. Yeah. I'll go back to Europe yet again. In their 2002 framework directives, they said we're going to, and I'm not saying this is the right way. It's an example of a way to have a coherent policy. We're hearing policy. European regulation praise that the American action. You know, <laughs> I don't. Take a picture, someone. I'll be clear. Especially I, by Fred, which is amazing. I'll be clear. <laughs> I actually don't love their policies, but I'm, the reason I keep raising them is they're actually better than what we've got going on now in the U.S., which is saddening. Uh, look, every four years, which probably, I don't know anything, whether that's a good time frame or not, they have to evaluate whether they have to define markets which is you know, an economic kind of term of art, and then determine whether those markets are competitive or not. If they're competitive, there's no ex ante regulation, i.e. no hard and fast rules written into the books. Uh, if they're not competitive, then the recommendation is you should write uh, ex ante rules to correct the problem. It's a very rational approach. It's a very disciplined approach. Well, what we see today at the SEC is utterly incoherent. Chairman Wheeler says, I want to promote competition, but I can't make sense of his policy whatsoever. So a year or two ago, uh, he, the FCC found under, under his leadership that uh, cable video markets are effectively competitive and should be price deregulated. Okay, I mean, I don't have a problem with that, but that's what he found. Now he's saying, there's not competition in the market. He's now defining this as a, an, an individual separate market in set-top boxes. And I think, well, at a minimum, there's as much competition for set-top boxes as there are cable operators. <laughs> and you found those to be effectively competitive and said they don't need to be price regulated. But when it comes to the set-top boxes they attach to those networks, which again, there are as many choices of those by definition as there are cable video providers saying, nope, not competitive, got to step in and rate. I can't make sense of this. The, uh, why? In my view, the FCC doesn't try to define markets in advance, and they don't try to make, you know, in their wireless reports for the last, ever since this administration took office, they say we're not going to make a finding. They don't do it because it allows them to do whatever they want in any particular case even if it's utterly and completely irrational. I mean, I liked the age of reason, you know, when, when people made decisions based on a, a consistent set of criteria. That's not what is, what's happening. So what does the SEC need to do? Either they or Congress need to actually set criteria for how they're going to evaluate competition, and then they need to take those criteria and apply them neutrally to the markets based on the facts. That's what courts do in court cases, and that's what good regulatory agencies do. That is not what we are seeing at the FCC, and it's very disappointing. Meredith. Uh, I will give two, uh, two answers in ascending order of wonkiness. Uh, the first <laughs> is uh, the special access proceeding, which has now been going on for 10 years. Uh, we just completed a five-year massive data collection. Uh, and, you know, we just, in terms of time horizons, if nothing else, we would like to see some action uh, and the, the special access proceeding drawn to some kind of resolution. By the uh, way, of definition, this is what connects an AT&T or Sprint or T-Mobile or Verizon wireless tower yeah. back to the rest of the Internet. Right. Um, and the second, uh, sort of even more in the weeds answer, is the 5.9 gigahertz proceeding, uh, which has been going on for 17 uh, years. 
uh, where uh, basically there's a band of spectrum held by the uh, automotive industry uh, for uh, car to infrastructure communication. Um, and it was originally sort of set aside with this uh, prior to the rise of, of GPS and some of the current um, lower band technologies, where this idea that we would have positioning and collision control based on things put in lampposts. And it, it hasn't materialized, and the automotive industry still has this pretty substantial band of spectrum uh, that they have been sitting on for quite some time and are loath to give up. Uh, you know, and we think that that could be put to better use, uh, either as unlicensed or put in the auction or in some format other than sort of, you know, just currently being left uh, desolate. So one quick comment I would mention, at least with the special access proceeding, which I've been following, it's actually fairly interesting when you look at a competitive, um, uh, when you look at the competitive effects. Another paper by him? Yeah, you can, which you can find outside. Um, it is only a one-year snapshot, at least, of that data, which I think is just at least somebody who analyzes dynamic markets. It's kind of interesting to look at that over time. I mean, that's, that's at least what you would hope uh, to be able to do, that the that the FCC would actually look at this as a changing market, um, which of course is, it does serve some problems. There are obviously some collection issues, but but just generally speaking, I mean, the entire purpose of that act, of that proceeding was was mainly to get the um, special access market to a competitive uh, competitive level, level playing field, and it doesn't seem, at least some of the some of the things that have happened since then seem to seem to suggest that the FCC is pulling back on that. Um, and we can, we can discuss that a little bit more in depth if we'd like. Uh, however, at least for me, the one thing that I would really like to see change with the FCC is that the FCC probably needs more economists and technologists, so it needs far more of a structural change. You know, being that it is a regulatory agency, it's one of the few regulatory agencies, even across the world, that actually does not have a Bureau of Economic Analysis. The FTC does. The EPA does. A whole bunch of other regulatory agencies actually have a Bureau of Economic Analysis. This is not instituted within the, uh, the FCC. It's not an institutional plank that they can really uh, fall back on. And when you look, for example, at the FTC, there sometimes are splits between the economic department and the economics department and the, uh, the lawyers. And I, that, to me, isn't a bad thing. It just shows that there's different perspectives on how policy should be driven. And I would very much like to see the FCC itself take this on. Maybe, maybe it's something that Congress might need to do. But generally speaking, competition is not, is not implemented within the FCC. There isn't an institutional place for competition to be understood within the FCC. And to me, changing that is actually a very important part of this conversation. So we've heard uh, praise for European regulations and an urge for expanding the FCC bureaucracy. <laughs> what else would you like to know? Reorganizing it. Uh, who has the microphone? Here we go. I love your sense of humor, by the way. It's good to keep them to levity here. Hi there. My name is Evelyn that. Smith. I'm with the American Enterprise Institute. And my question is continuing the theme of competition. So currently, the FCC doesn't seem to view wireless and wireline broadband as being competitive with one another. Um, for example, their 25 megabits per second definition of what broadband is only applies to wireline providers. And given the advancements in wireless that we're expecting down the pipeline, we have 5G, services like Starry, I guess the question would be, what would it take to get the FCC to see these services as competitive and potentially view wireless as a solution for, say, rural regions where we don't have a lot of broadband competition? So I'll actually take this. Um, so I actually wrote public knowledge comments in the, uh, uh, the sort of state of the net proceeding. Uh, and one of the big issues that came up was whether or not wireline and wireless are substitutable. And it, fundamentally, uh, you know, the technology is advancing, but fundamentally there are physical limitations on wireless that just don't exist on wireline. Um, you know, wireless signal strength can vary depending on whether you're a hill or a valley, whether, uh, you know, it can, whether or not it's raining, occasionally even on phases of the moon. Um, this is an actual thing that can impact wireless signal quality. Uh, and, and that's just part and parcel of being, uh, you know, linked to wireless electromagnetic spectrum as opposed to going through a piece of fiber. Um, obviously, I think the technology is getting better. Um, the more deployment we get and the more robust um, the infrastructure gets, I think a lot of those problems will be, if not resolved, at least ameliorated. Um, I think part of the rationale that the FCC uh, holds for not uh, defining them as comparable or substitutable products, which I agree with, is that there are simply some things that you cannot do on wireline that are very data intensive that you can do, or that you cannot do on wireless, sorry, um, that you can do on wireline. So streaming 4K video is just going to take up so much data. 
uh, that it's just not really feasible on, you know, I can't not hook even up. The like, last OS X update I downloaded was one and a half gigs, which may say something about Apple's coding, but, you know, that would put a serious dent in anyone's wireless data cap. Right, and that's not even talking about data caps. Um, you know, and I think this is actually, it sort of segues into another, um, and I, I apologize for sort of jumping off of your question a little bit. Um, but, you know, one of the things about data caps is that there really is a difference between wireline and wireless data caps. I think there's a good argument to be made about wireless data caps um, and whether they fall under reasonable network management, um, whether some data caps are truly linked to network management or whether they are rent extraction. Uh, but when you're dealing in wireline, almost no just average home consumer is going to be burning through so much data on your wireline connection that you need to put a data cap on them. Uh, it's an artificial scarcity problem uh, in which you know wireline broadband providers can look at this you know captive market that they have functionally, uh, and doubly so uh, as data caps become more prevalent among wireless or wireline competitors. Uh, you know you're going to get a data cap wherever you go as we see this becoming more prevalent, um, and they can look at this and go you know I could extract another thirty bucks a month uh, based on this person's usage, uh, and so why not? Um, you know, and so I think, again, that's sort of tangential to your question, but I think uh, sort of an interesting point of discussion that's coming up more and more in policy arguments lately. I'd, I'd, oh, go ahead. No, uh, uh, well, there's, there's two issues. Well, one, one issue, which is the data cap issue, which is, um, I mean, there clearly are power users who probably actually do overwhelm local node networks, which kind of complicates that. I mean, we can have that discussion whether or not that data caps themselves or data, you know, data limitations, data plans are actually... Um, useful, which I, I think personally they are useful. But there's a different discussion which, which you brought up. Um, I would highly suggest for you to wait about two weeks, I would assume, it, because I'm actually writing a very large report on this, um, looking at the history, looking at what we know about the economics. And it's actually fairly complicated, at least in a number of different markets, where the wire line services are not particularly great. Those um, places that uh, a number of competitive, uh, the competitive, uh, um, you know, the, the competitive policy re regulation, or rather, the competitive um, market clearly does exist, such that there are there is substitution between wireless uh, from wired to wireless. There are a number of cases already where you're seeing just wireless only individuals. So uh, something like, I think it's about 5 million, I think this is what I calculated, I can, I can find this data for you, but at least 5 million consumers have the option of other, of other, uh, other wired broadband services, and yet they're choosing just to stay in wireless services. This is actually something that when you look at the Pew data, it also suggests. You're seeing, for example, that something like 60% of the people who actually cord cut are going purely to wireless. So it's not even necessarily just the wired, you know, that, that there is this cord cutting between people who, you know, are, are, are have a television component and also have a broadband component and are just going specifically to the broadband, fixed broadband service. A very significant portion of them are actually going over specifically into wireless services. So there's a lot that's going on here. The other thing I would mention is that one gig uh, 5G services are not that far away, probably only about four years at this point. So this is the 5G. Um, this is the 5G revolution, the Internet of Things is something that is probably will change the marketplace pretty dramatically. Those services are already being tested out. The one, one gig download is already being, you know, already being tested out by Ericsson right now under 4G standards, so it'll likely be implemented. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of competition in this space. Um, as far as when will the FCC acknowledge that these two are substitutable, that's an even more kind of, I think, complicated question about uh, market substitutability, which it is probably the case that wireless c consumers are substitutable for wired consumers, but the other way around is not the same. So it's unidirectional, as, it, as it's mentioned, um, which I don't know, again, if the FCC, given that it really doesn't have any economists, could even tell you what that means. The, well, I shouldn't what? say they don't have any economists. They don't have an economics bureau that would actually do the kind of analysis that you would actually have to do in order to make that kind of uh, make that kind of uh, uh, result. I could talk about this for an hour, but I'm going to use the Europe shorthand again because it's so <laughs> proven so popular and yeah. humorous. In in their their most recent again, they're required to do these market definitions and analyses. And their most recent you know four year periodic review, it was 2014, I think. They price deregulated the wireline telephone market. The entire wireline telephone market in the U.S. is still price regulated. 
despite the fact there's very strong evidence that um, mobile phones have are, are a substitute uh, under generally recognized economic principles uh, for wireline phone. Which That's my shorthand way of saying the FCC hasn't shown any inclination to do the IP transition in any kind of reasonable time frame. The IP transition is also complete in several European countries uh, uh, where substitutability is relatively clear. So I certainly don't expect a Wheeler administration to do anything about uh, the substitutability question on broadband. I mean, wow, if they can't get past wireline telephone, they're, they're nowhere near where they need to be intellectually to make any other type of uh, move. Well, I, I will jump on that. I'm sorry, this is actually tech train. The IP transition is sort of one of my, my pet topics. Um, and just, and without getting into an entire 20 minute discussion of tech transition, which is its own beast entirely, um, I think there is a lot of debate on whether or not a wireline and wired telephones are substitutes in terms of things like battery life, in terms of things like reliability, emergency services. Um, you know, there is a, a pretty robust debate. But having said that, I always welcome more economists. Um, you know, as a, a public interest person, I think economic analysis always contributes to the discussion. Uh, I spent seven years at the University of Chicago, so I'm always fans of economists. Um, I grew up around them. So, uh, yeah, no, I think it, it's definitely uh, something that needs to be addressed. Um, but in terms of market sensitivity, I think you're right. It's a, it's a complex question, um, and it's one that, you know, I think the FCC is going to need to address going forward. Mm -hmm. One other question, please. Hi, I'm Al Alan Holmes with the Center for Public Integrity. Um, going back on municipal broadband, one of the topics that wasn't discussed was that how these laws came about, and about uh, in the 20 states that have the laws, that uh, it's the role of the ISPs in either passing the laws or killing the laws that try to expand. Uh, we, we, we've seen that in Chattanooga uh, just recently and in uh, North Carolina. So uh, we all know about the North Carolina state legislature <laughs> these days. Okay. Um, yeah, having gone to school at Chapel Hill, uh, I understand it as well. Um, anyway, uh, I was just wondering if you can just dis uh, comment about the role that in uh, forming public policy on municipal broadband that the ISPs have had over the course of the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, so speaking very generally, I, I obviously they have, uh, you know, had, a, I'd argue, an outsized role in determining this on the state level. Um, and part of that is just a practical issue, I think, with all, uh, you know, all politics when you trickle down to the state level is there are groups like, uh, there are sort of consumer-oriented groups in Washington, uh, perhaps not in abundance in tech policy because it's still a relatively nascent field. Um, but, you know, there's groups like Public Knowledge, Free Press, uh, sort of EFF working in the, the um uh, on the court side, um, and you don't really, it is, it, telecom issues and things like muni broadband are, frankly, uh, it's a super wonky in the weeds topic. Um, and you know, the advantage to an ISP of that is it's very difficult to cultivate the kind of expertise that you need to develop a sufficient uh, and equal pushback at a state level. Um, and so a lot of, you know, a lot of Washington groups, we really don't have uh, public knowledge, at least doesn't have a huge grassroots presence, um, which is because we're mostly focused on things going on at the national level. Um, and, you know, when you've got any kind of sufficiently wonky topic, there is going to be a problem cultivating uh, an equal but opposite pushback uh, at the state level. And so I think that's been, you know, a systemic problem, not only in telecom policy, but in, you know, a lot of economic policy writ large. One other thing I would mention about this is, you know, in addition to that, that there is, there is, a, there has been for a very large, for, for many reasons, there's, I think that within the last at least five years, there's been a sea change. Not to say that these, these, these laws weren't passed primarily because there's obviously a lot of state level regulation, um, but that the municipalities themselves never really saw that their relationship between the ISP or the provider was actually one where, where, um, where the ISP necessarily loses or they, they win. And the point is, the point largely with this is that when you look at a number of cities and you look at how much money they actually have from, from the broadband providers, from the franchise fees, which is something I've written also about, which is another wonky space. Um, a great example is LA has something like $35 million sitting in an escrow account from franchise fees. Now, what are those franchise fees actually doing? They're quite literally sitting in an account that are not being used, and yet ostensibly that this money is supposed to go back to 
LA in order to help with the build out, with help with ancillary technologies. So I guess the point here is that largely there's been this long relationship and, and it's kind of a weird relationship between providers and then also the state and municipal regulators that I think for a very, very long time, and especially until uh, Google really got into this space and Fiverr got into this space, the, the demand for better services was really never a thing that, that worried too many people. And so there will be, I think in the future, I mean, there's a lot of people who are working on this. So there is a lot of people, especially in the state level, who are pressing back against this. Um, I know, at least in Illinois, there's been some organizations who have been doing this. Um, I do encourage that, but by the same token, I think that also we need to think more clearly about the relationship between the provider and the local regulators. Um, there's a lot there. I mean, if you want to talk about rights of way, I can always chat with you afterwards. But that's a whole different space that I actually think the FCC probably could do a little bit better about. I, I may be misinterpreting the question, so forgive me if, if I am. But I, I actually interpreted the question as, uh, as, as asking us to opine in a way that would result in an ad hominem attack, a logical fallacy. And I, I do see that. You know, in the Twitter sphere, calling someone a shill has become de rigueur, you know, it's the, it's the, what everyone does, it's very dangerous. I mean, when judges sit in a court of law, which is one of our three pillared institutions upon which we all rely, they know that each of the attorneys represents someone, and in fact, they have ethical obligations to do so zealously. And, uh, you know, so the idea that, you know, ISPs have lobbied, it, it, Okay, nice to note, but I mean, at the end of the day, the question the policymakers always have to ask themselves is, what are, is this you know, a legal policy and is it good public policy, whether you use you know, whatever metric you use, economics and the like. And it, you know, it's not a bad idea to know who made the argument, but it's, it's really dangerous to, to, to dis make decisions based on who's speaking. In fact, I, you know, I would argue it's, it's inconsistent with you know, everything that our Constitution stands for, to be honest. I mean, the, the, you would say that money doesn't influence politics. It influences everything. Well, we'll have to remind the, the people saying, well, the, the real bad guy in that neutrality is, is Google, that we should also not <laughs> that way either. Yeah, I'm not anti Google. Uh, I'm basically pro Google. I'm pro Yahoo as well. Please remember to use their. <laughs> <laughs> They've got an okay email, email system, I swear. Uh, I think that's about all the time we have. Yes. On that right. note, uh, please join me in thanking the panel, and thank you, Rob, for moderating. You're welcome.